Okay, we're recording, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good evening. It's August 19th, 2024. This is a regular meeting of the town council. The open meeting law allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present at the meeting location. However, tonight, in fact, we do have a quorum in the room. There are seven of us. Um, we can, however, we need to do this by providing adequate access to all people who want to attend. We do that by Zoom, by phone, as a live broadcast on Amherst Media Channel 9 and their live stream. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the August 19th regular town council meeting to order at 631. I'll call upon each councilor by name that they have indicated that they would like to be addressed. At that time, please unmute your mic and say present. This will indicate that we can hear you and you can hear us. Please remember to mute your mic again after saying present. We'll begin with Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Councilor Ette is not here yet. I expect him. Lynn Griesmer is present. Councilor Hannick. Present. Bob Hegner. Present. Councilor Lord. Present. Pam Rooney. Here. Councilor Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. I'm here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. I actually am expecting her later. Councilor Walker. At present, I don't see her. Okay. Um, there is no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena and me know. To make a comment or ask a question, please use the raised hand button. If technical difficulties arise as a result of utilizing remote participation, Athena and I will decide how to address that situation. And if we need to, we will suspend the meeting until we can make sure all connectivity exists again. There is one change to the agenda tonight, and that is there is no consent agenda because we have no minutes to approve at this time. I do wanna note, however, that the votes of the council are always posted within 24 hours of each council meeting. So unlike, so although we may not have a set of approved minutes, we do in fact have a set of votes that are public. Um, otherwise, the order of the agenda remains the same. There will be one general public comment period during the meeting. Uh, I wanna make the following announcements and that is our next town council meeting is on September 9th at, six, uh, at 6.30. Uh, the community resources committee meeting will not be on August 27th. I believe their next meeting is September 10th. Okay. The finance committee will be, be meeting on September 3rd and GOL, Governance Organization and Legislation, will meet on August 22nd, Town Services and Outreach on August 29th. One just announcement of an upcoming event, and that's the first day celebration, uh, celebrating the opening of school. That will be this Sunday, August 25th, from 4.30 to 6.30 at Kendrick Park. There's no hearing. So we will move on to general public comment. If you are in the room and you would like to make general public comment, please make sure that you have registered with Athena. If you're on Zoom and you would like to make general public comment, please raise your hand at this time. Okay. We're moving on to general public comment. I know if you are in Zoom and you have just joined us, please, and you would like to make general public comment, please raise your hand at this time. Okay, Athena, do we have anybody in the room? Thank you. Point of order, Lynn, Alicia has joined us. I think if you wanted to check in with her before we move to. Thank you, I appreciate that. Alicia, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can, thank you. Okay, thank you for joining us. Um, 
public comment on matters within the jurisdiction of the town council are, can be made for up to three minutes tonight. The council will not engage in a dialogue or comment on matters raised during general public comment. Public comments are not reflective of the opinions of the town council. The First Amendment broadly protects individual rights to address the government, to speak, and to express themselves, including their right to say hateful and offensive things. I am generally unable to shut those commenters down under the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution unless their level of speech falls within an exception articulated by the courts, such as fighting words, true threats to a particular individual, harassment of a particular individual, or incitement of eminent lawless activity. If a question exists as to whether a particular speaker is engaging in unprotected speech, I must defer to the principles of freedom of speech. With that, we're going to go on. We will call on the one person that has raised their hand uh, for public comment. Uh, Maria Kopecki, please enter the room. State your name and where you live. Hi, Maria Kopecki. I live in South Amherst. Thank you. So I'd like to make a comment uh, related to the Jones Library Building Project. I'm not sure if all of the... Um, Oh, um, it's asking me to lower my hand. Hang on a second. Um, I don't know if the town councilors are aware of this, but the nearly $2 million in historic tax credits have been rejected not once, but twice. Um, and I'm not sure who was aware of this and when they were aware. So back in December, actually back in November of 2023, uh, the Massachusetts Historic Commission wrote a letter to the library director informing them that there are, were going to be issues. And then in December, there was a formal rejection of this nearly $2 million in historic tax credits. That did not get brought up at your deliberations when you were talking about whether to approve another $10 million in borrowing for this project. Fast forward to April uh, and an application was made again for these tax credits with very little, if any, changes. And not surprisingly, those tax credits were again rejected. This is nearly $2 million. Um, and you have had deliberations and votes about this project since that time. This is really not acceptable that this information was only made known when it, there was a direct question asked about uh, an invoice about the tax credits. <clears throat> you should have known when you were deliberating in November and December. You should have known in the spring when you were deliberating. And I hope that the town council takes it upon itself to get to the bottom of this and find out who knew. Who knew about this? Did the trustees know? Some of them seemed pretty surprised about it. Did the town manager know? Did anybody on the town council know? Because one of two things happened. This information was in the hands of the library director and they chose not to share that with any of these groups or the public, or it was shared and then other people didn't share that with the public. So I'm asking that you find out what went on there and I hope that you will take some appropriate action. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, there's one other person that ent ent entered a little bit later. They do have their hand up. Please enter the room. Pat, state your name and where you live. Good evening. Can people hear me? You can, we can. Okay, I have Pat Ananibaku. I'm a resident for three years. I'm here tonight. The applicants have not been distributed equally in our town. My group is still waiting to receive upper funds. You supervise the town manager. And in one of his goals is equity. And I hope that you will do your job to ensure that there is equity 
in our town. My group, Black Business Association of Amherst Area, we're leaving all options on the table if we do not get upper funds. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Pat. Seeing that there are no more hands, that concludes public comment. As I mentioned earlier, there is no consent agenda and we have no resolutions or proclamations. We are going to move to a discussion of the town manager's goals. And let me preface this by saying, like many people on the council, and I'm sure in the public, there's no perfect process. And this is certainly not a perfect process. At our town council meeting on July 15th, we agreed to spend a specific amount of time, about an hour, on town manager goals during the next couple meetings, uh, particularly ones that require additional discussion, either because we need to clarify what we mean by the goal or the sub goal, or two, determine what the town of Amherst can do to make progress toward achieving the goal or sub goal, and three, define how we would like to measure that goal or sub goal. One of the major reasons to have this discussion is to determine where we would like the town manager and his staff to focus their limited resources. With input from the vice president, assistant town manager, clerk of the town council, and assistant and executive assistant at our recent, um, oh, I guess the heavens have spoken, uh, at our recent um, agenda review meeting, I developed the memo that is attached to the goal rankings that you saw in July. Tonight, I am proposing that the council briefly discuss the reality of our limited resources, determine if we should focus on any other goals besides number one, climate action, and number four, affordable housing. Affordable housing is the one we would focus on tonight. And three, review the sub goals under affordable housing tonight in an effort to answer the three questions or issues that I laid out earlier. And then on September 9th, depending on the outcome of tonight, we would move on to goal number one, which would be climate action. And we would take any necessary steps at that point uh, regarding the goals. Although at this, I wanna make sure that we really understand it's not really appropriate to be changing goals mid-year when we look upon them as yearly goals or even as two-year goals. So the first thing I wanna ask is, as we look at these goals, um, and actually I'm gonna pause for a moment and make sure that Councillor Ette can hear us. Yes. Okay, and you'll be coming on screen. Thank you so much. Um, so the first question is, should we focus only on those two goals or are there other goals that the council would like us to focus on? Andy. This may not directly respond to your question, but I did want to say something at the beginning of the process because I've been uncomfortable with the process that we've been engaging in about ranking priorities uh, as a, at the last meeting. And I've been trying to think about why that was. And uh, I think we did an excellent job um, early, um, early in the process of identifying town manager goals by extension council goals. I um, also have to note that the third paragraph to the goals that we adopted in December recognize that the policy priorities are multi-year policy goals and may be revised or um, in response to emerging circumstances and can only be pursued with uh, available resources. And that's a direct quote from our own document. We are asked to rank goals that... Um, have repeated from prior years. The council and the town manager had devoted time and resources to achieving them, but the work is not finished. 
three quick examples, Climate Action Goal 3A, the Waste Hauler Bylaw, Climate uh, Goal 3B, the Solar Bylaw, and uh, sub, uh, so race, Racial and Social Justice Sub-Goal 2 to support the work of the town in repairing the damage of structural racism in Amherst, uh, also known as reparations. Um, aren't these high priorities because of the previous decisions and work to be to achieve them? I think that is one of the things that I'm concerned about, about going back and trying to prioritize these goals without recognizing the work that's been done and the fact that those are multi-year goals. I also want to conclude this by saying that uh, the exercise should also remind us as counselors that we should consider these goals and our priorities as we introduce proposed policy bylaw or other initiative. Our experience with these three examples I provided should, should remind us that doing so is asking the town manager and the council to allocate time and resources to consider these proposals. We might want to consider a policy to guide the council when deciding whether to refer a proposal to committee, that policy would presumably include whether the proposal is consistent with council goals and priorities. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other comments at this time in general that people would like to make? And then I'm gonna go back to my original question and that is, if we focus on housing tonight and we focus on climate action on the ninth, are there other goals that people would like us to spend time focusing on in another council meeting? Alicia. Um, I'm just wondering about uh, why we chose those two goals specifically again. Um, I'm not opposed to focusing on housing tonight and climate action in another meeting, but I think that if we're going to be ultimately using these goals as a tool to measure the progress of the town manager, then I think we should have a clear understanding of all of the goals and what we're looking for underneath, underneath each sub goal. Um, and I do agree with Andy that it's kind of complicated because we have, you know, new goals that we hope to see initiated and work to begin on those goals. And then we have continuing ongoing goals. And I know mm -hmm. that we have a process that we're using right now to do town manager evaluations, but I'm not sure about the efficacy of the goal, just because I also think it leaves a lot of wiggle room for us as counselors individually to decide how we're going to be rating and using them as a tool of measurement. Um, so ultimately, <clears throat> I hope that we can re like address the evaluation method that we use and maybe the rating method and how we really talk about and rate these things. Um, and I hope that throughout the course of the year, we will look at and talk about all of the goals that we have set for the town manager for this year. Okay. Thank you. George? So, I'm sorry, Councillor Ryan. That's, so I um, made an exercise for myself this evening just to list the things that I consider the most important, um, which is perhaps not really answering uh, the president's question but uh, neither one really fell into the category of climate action or housing affordability. None of the ones that I listed for myself, um, which doesn't mean I don't care about climate action and I don't care about housing affordability. Um, so again, I'm struggling with this process, but the list I came up, we started off with infrastructure, particularly wastewater treatment plant and our sewer infrastructure and what the plan is and how we're going to pay for it over the next few years. Um, We've talked about DPW and the fire station over and over again. That also is at the top of my list. Um, road and sidewalk repairs is something I hear about all the time. It's at the top of my list. Um, and we've just taken 500,000 out of the road repair fund. 
and what we spend on sidewalks is, is really not adequate to the need. And then there's the senior center and the banks. Um, where do they stand in this process? Um, are, is that something we wanna talk about? Um, is that something we've already decided is not among the uh, priorities of this particular council because they're not in this list? Um, but I just was struck by how my particular priorities, the ones that I would like to focus on, uh, don't really fall into these two categories. Okay. Pam. Thank you. Um, if we are if we are adding topics for discussion, I think the uh, discussion of economic vitality, in particular, item number one, which says work with higher institutions uh, for the da 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 da. But it is the it is I think one of our. <laughs> It's a topic that that comes up and and to date has really not been addressed adequately. Working with our higher ed institutions and there have been some um, pretty in depth letters to us um, with comparison tables of how other communities have have better town gown working groups, how we have better um, actually better payment. Uh, and contribution from the higher education institutions to the community. And I think that's a critical one given that we are a college town. Okay, Councilor Lord. Yes, um, I do hope we get to all of them, but I also like to um, lift up six, racial equity and social justice. Um, eventually that will be our lens through which we approach everything, but um, there's vacancies on CSSJC, on the HRC and in CRESS. So how as a town council can we support our town manager and our town in these different DEI um, racial and social justice programs that are are needing a little bit of help and um, support from us and I believe the town manager as well. Thanks. Okay. Kathy. Um, then I might have not have understood what you were doing with your grids um, and asking us to look at the sub pieces. I thought what you were doing was in some areas, we had so many different pieces to the main goal that you were seeing whether there was some consensus on one or two within them. So in existence and climate and housing, it wasn't saying the others were not important. So I thought that's what you were trying to do. Because I, my overarching one is the amount of money the town has to spend. We as counselors have to think really carefully of where we're spending it. And Pam's comment on if there are other sources for money that can be enhanced because of the way we work with major institutions, should we have a full court press to getting more? And we've had that in the financial guidelines every year. So I didn't take it that we were diminishing them. And if people look across her grid, the word money never appears. <laughs> you know, we're just assuming he'll be financially accountable, but we have major projects. George listed a bunch of them. And since we can't do everything in terms of the dollars we're spending, we're going to have to make choices and help the manager. So I just, I thought you had picked out two, where there was such a long list underneath to see whether there was some agreement about sub goals. So maybe I misunderstood because I wouldn't have necessarily said those were the only two or the main two. I would have started with the big things we need to get done, either start to get done in the coming year or get done over the next couple of years. So I'll just, and that was my comment. Uh Councillor Walker, I'm going to skip to Pat DeAngelis since she's not. I start to go for. Oh, okay. I was going to go to you because you hadn't spoken yet. Okay, Councillor Walker. Uh, thank you. I'll be quick because Councillor Lord said most of what I was going to say, so I want to echo that. But I also just want to add that my interest in wanting to also focus on our racial equity goal is to talk more about how that goal is applicable across all of the goals and how we're really using an equity lens across all goals. And I think that that also goes for our climate action goal um, because those two really are applicable to all of the categories and all of the decisions. And so I would like to have a larger discussion about that as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Pat. Thank you. Um... 
I'm being very quiet in this discussion because I think um, while it's important to hear all of the different issues that people have about specific goals, goals that aren't there, and the lenses we use and where I find myself in agreement or disagreement becomes less important to me. We generally start working on town manager goals towards the end of the year on, for the following year, which is what we're coming up to. The important issue for me that hasn't been addressed in any of this is the timing and evaluation uh, in relation to the development of the budget guidelines and manager goals. That was something that GOL was charged with, which was on the carryover menu, which we started to work on and were unable to complete because of the other things that came forward. So I'm feeling like while it is important for me to hear what people are interested in, I'm not interested in changing any goals between now and the end of the year. All of this and, and the process that we're using can be uh, incorporated into what is going to happen in a few months. So I would like to see this discussion minimized right now so we could go on to other things. Pat, I need to understand you, you don't want to have the discussion now about any of this? Yeah, I guess that's what I'm saying, because I feel like it's we're going to be soliciting all this information from counselors, from committees, from staff. We're going to be because we have not been able yet to change the process. And it just seems to me I could sit here and say what's important to me. But where is that getting us right now? And and I, I appreciate the attempt, but I think that we need to get on to doing it differently or not at all right now. Okay. Councillor Haneke. I guess I partially agree with Councillor DeAngelis, but only to a certain extent, because one of the problems I see these, we have to remember these are the manager's goals that we set that even when we set them, we knew they were impossible to meet. And I see these conversations while uh, twofold. And I'm gonna look at the housing goal four. He cannot possibly in one year with the planning department as it stands right now with someone who has announced their retirement, at least one vacancy, if not two, propose measures that meet two, three, four, and five in the course of a single year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yet our goal says he's supposed to do that. And this conversation I see as number one, helping him, although we are three months away from him <laughs> writing his self-evaluation on it. Um, so I was pushing for it earlier, helping him decide and, and, deploy staff to of two, three, four, and five, which one is the most important that the council wants to really see a measure in? Mm -hmm. And number two, we need to stop. It might help us recognize as a council as we move into our next conversation in a couple months about town manager goals, recognize that we cannot put one through six in housing affordability anymore, that we can't put two, three, four, and five, that we actually do have to come to con some consensus to eliminate that down to one to make them not just doable and achievable by the manager, but to actually accomplish something. Because when you've got four things that are in no sense achievable, then why do any of it in a sense? And and that's it, it, why, because we need to, but how do you get to doing something? You're almost in a stasis of, I don't know where to start. And so I see these conversations, hopefully when we get to housing as helping us as a council, not just give him some direction now, but move to potentially when December rolls around and we adopt new manager goals, being able to cull those one to six down to one or two. Okay. Uh, Anna? I 
Um, so this conversation that we're having tonight arose in part from part of the reason why I think I share Pat's Pat, I don't know if they're frustrations, but for me, I think why I share and what you were, what you were saying is that this topic started as a uh, result of our retreat, right? We had the retreat, we talked about our goals and then things kept getting pushed and pushed and pushed because we have a lot of other things going on. And now we're at a point where it's nearly September. Our next meeting is in September. We're coming up on December shockingly fast when we have to start this process over. And for me, I think part of my challenge is we're not adjusting or changing these goals. How helpful is this exercise? And the focus, you know, my understanding, and I asked the president this question in agenda setting, I said, look, you know, we only have two goals on the agenda. And, and, you know, I think she, she rightly explained back that when we looked at the grid, these, these, those two goals had that longest list that needed to be parsed out. It wasn't that the other goals weren't important. It wasn't that they they weren't a priority. It was that these ones needed to have discussion to just to tease out what they meant. And I think my takeaway, especially, and I hope other members of GOL are are noticing this too, is for us as we come present something to the council, there's so much more that we need to be doing in shaping these goals for the future to avoid this kind of what feels a bit like a quagmire to me. This feels messy. And I struggle at times, totally candidly, I struggle at times to see the purpose when we are almost in September. So what I am hoping from this exercise is for that we that we get from this exercise is a bit more clarity on what's going to be more useful going forward. And I think starting with these two goal areas, again, that's not because they are priority areas. It is not that they were more important than any of the other goals that we set. It's that these two were the messiest in the goals that we gave the town manager. Um, it's not maybe the the most formal framing of the problem, but I think that's where we we as a council need to tease this out better so that we are giving actual attainable one or two or however long we decide on year goals to the manager in the coming year. But this isn't, um, I, I think I wanted to kind of reframe a second benefit of having this conversation because I also was feeling a bit at a loss when, when we were continuing to discuss something that was supposed to really be wrapped up in like February. Or January. Yeah, January. Right. Um, let me try the following. Okay. I'm not going to suggest an under goal five, which is the housing affordability goal. Let's just focus on that one. The first one is to ensure the operation of a seasonal or year round shelter. Is there anybody that feels we need to spend time discussing what that means, what the town can or cannot do about it, and how we would measure that? Let me just give you an example. We already have a shelter that functions out of a church and we're working on the other shelter. In fact, we recently demolished the VFW building. Um, the goal is to build something. It depends on money. Is there anybody that doesn't understand what that goal means? Is there anybody that, I'm not saying whether you share that goal, what that goal means and what we would see as measuring it. And the reason I asked that is because I want you to look at the next one. Proposed measures to increase the diversity of housing stock available to all residents. What do we mean? What can the town do? What do we accept as a measure? Those are the questions we have to ask. And you may have other questions you think we should ask. Councillor Haneke. I'm always happy to start. Okay, um, two, three, I'm just gonna talk about two, three, four, and five together. They all start with proposed measures. What it means to me is I want to see zoning bylaws proposed, changes to the zoning. Um, but it, it might not always be zoning. Some of it could 
depending on which one you're looking at, um, proposed measures to retain, promote, increase home ownership might be, we have a general bylaw about um, ta tax incentive financing, um, things like that, that could be used for affordable, and, and it actually can, right? So it doesn't always have to be zoning. It could be something creative that is non-zoning, but is something that we would adopt. It is not, to me, this one is not support of measures from, support of applications from developers that are already at the planning board. This is, to me, each one of those is a way to increase those applications, increase development in our town. Um, which one of them is most important to me? That's a conversation I'd love, uh, or to the council, that's a conversation I'd love to have because we could probably combine two, three, four, five into one if we can get consensus on the council as to which one of those we really want to see progress on. How do we make it easier to increase the housing stock in town? How do we make it easier for people to own homes in town when they are lower moderate income? How do we make it easier to have more rental attainable rental housing available? That one might not be a zoning measure, I don't know. Um, and and number five, how do we make, how do we through some sort of legislation potentially stabilize housing in town? Which of those four is most important to each of us or the council as a whole? So that that's what we can go tell the planning department or the manager who could then direct and advise the planning department, this is what they really wanna see. Some sort of measure that pick one that actually would increase the availability of missile, the, the, the applications for building missing middle housing in town, quadplexes, triplexes, duplexes, townhomes. I'd love to see bylaws that might have a real effect of doing that in town, but I'm just one of 13. And I, let me just go back and say, I think combining the conversation of two, three, four, and five gets at the crux of, well, why do we say, maybe we should discuss this goal? It's because there is no consensus and it's maybe not an either or, but it's, if each of these is a goal that hits at a separate population, if you will, that we're trying to help have, find residents in Amherst, what can the town do? And in what, you know, with our limited resources, are there thoughts on this? Councilor Ryan. So I guess I come back to the, from the perspective of the town manager, um, what can he do now? Um, Mandy suggested some possibilities of things that he could do in instructing the planning department, for instance, to pursue X, Y, or Z, um, but without a consensus amongst us as to what specifically we're trying to accomplish, which I think at the moment does not exist, um, from a very practical point of view, it doesn't seem like we can give any explicit instruction to the town manager related to this particular goal. So I'm open to thoughts or suggestions from individuals who think, oh no, there is in fact something that there is a consensus on that we could tell the town manager we'd like him to work on. And that's something that I think applies both today for the next three months or four months, but also for the future task of setting goals in the future for the town manager. Um, I'm always coming back to the question, well, then what is that? What are we instructing the town manager to do? Um, and in this one, I don't see any consensus. So individual counselors could perhaps pursue as they have and uh, you know, air, air actions in this area, but I don't see how the council as a whole at the moment is prepared to uh, come to some agreement about a specific set of housing goals that they could town, send, say to the town manager, please um, work with the planning department to uh, work on these. 
Am I missing something? Is there a consensus here that I'm not seeing? Well, I'm, I'm going to call on the town manager, but one of the things that I want each of you to think about as you look at two, three, and four specifically is what has the town already done? What have we done over the last six years or it may be even more? What have we done in terms of these? And are we satisfied with what we've done? But with that, I want to call on Paul. Uh, thank you. So I think um, first we have to recognize that um, with Chris's retirement, there's going to be an interregnum of some sort that's going to just cloud this. But I think what you can say is what did the council accomplish? You've set a set of goals as a consent. You've voted on a set of goals. It's very, very large and comprehensive. You could say, and, and then with this document, you have sort of prioritized them through the yellow and the orange and the hashes and all that stuff. You could say, take the, what's the most opportune thing to advance town manager and staff and move forward on those things. As long as it's from this, we want to, but you know what our priorities are. We know you're not going to get them to all of them. You're going to choose, choose the most opportunistic um, path and we don't need to spend a lot of time. We as a council don't need to spend a lot of time on saying this path versus that path, as long as it's one of these paths. You could take that approach given the time frame where we are, or you could spend a lot of time sort of working through option A, B, or C versus, and you know, I think there you could eventually get to consensus, but it will take some time. So one of the options for you right now, given the month we're in and the the staffing situation we're in is to just to say, we produced enough information for you. You've given you our list of goals. Mid-year we went through and we've prioritized after a retreat. And now we want to see what you're going to do with them. Comments. Happy. Um, just building on what Paul said, I didn't understand when why this had an hour tonight and then potentially an hour at the next meeting. Because I agree, I think we have a document and I think that's where Pat started to go. I understand we're not being very clear on some of these. And I do think if you start with housing, we have disagreement on what the problem is. And if you don't know what you think the problem is, figuring out solutions. However, there's been some creative, very creative staff and planning bed work around University Drive. We've produced, the town of Amherst has a huge number of new dwelling units in the town over the course of the, our time in the council. It's not that there's nothing been happening, it's, it's tremendous. And if you use the word affordability, everybody has the problem of anything new that's built is really expensive. Um, so I was looking at the duplexes up in Sunderland. It was amazing what you had to sell each half for. So unless someone had some extra money, they weren't going to build a duplex to live in one half of it and rent the other. I mean, they had to start. And some of these were built two or three years ago. So I, what we're running against is what we're seeing when we built the North Amherst Library, the expansion. <laughs> it it ended up costing twice what we thought because of supply costs, because of labor costs. So I think what you've done, Lynn, is you've given, you've found some areas in the more complicated ones where there seem to be a few things that jump out. And Paul's just said, we've, we've been discussing this. So if we're not clear on what the hopes are for housing, whether they're unrealistic hopes, I'm, aware, I'm holding my, breath on the terrific first time home buyer complex we're going to have coming in, that they're going to be able to find people who can afford them. You know, I, th I think we're all thinking they will, but they need every single one of those units to be full to make their economic model work. And that's with huge state subsidies. So I don't think spending a lot of time tonight on this one or climate, now that you've got a few subgroups within them makes a lot of sense to me because we've got we've got some big issues coming to us and I'd rather have us have long conversations about them. So I'll just stop there rather than 
spend time tonight trying to parse down in each of the goals. I just think within them, we've done some highlighting and some are cross cutting. We, we can have another retreat if people want it, but I really don't. Okay, Pam. Thank you. Um, I appreciate what Paul said to us and I would, I would tend to agree that we're on course if we want to adjust the timing and the process, then we do it for the next round. Um, not all of these goals are created equal. And, and I mean it in the way that some are aspirational goals and they're not really goals. These are all objectives, but, but some of these are aspirational. They're sort of a reminder to the town manager and staff of desirable outcomes. Um, some are in progress. Some are opportunistic. They can only happen when grant funding comes in. Mm -hmm. So I, I, it is a mix of, it's a mix of opportunities, I think. And I look forward to hearing from the town manager how they have tackled all of these, all of these items, but they obviously will happen in, in different manners. Other comments on this? And and I agree that we don't need to spend a lot of time on them. Okay. Other comments on this? Anything else? George. So That's again, just <clears throat> off the top of my head, thinking about what's actually going on in the area of housing, we have the Belchertown Road and East Street School project all underway. Ball Lane is underway. We have the overlay at U Drive, which seems to be eventually will come, I think, to the council. Um, we have hired a firm to look into possibility of a permanent shelter slash transitional housing um, at the former VFW site. The VFW site building has been taken down. And I believe I'm correct in saying that we have a set of conversations beginning in the fall with UMass. And one of the topics is housing. Um, I think another is economic development. Um, so that seems like a pretty uh, impressive set of tasks that are all underway. And we're not saying to Paul, stop this one and that one and focus on the other one. Um, they're going to move at the pace they're going to move at. But I, I get the sense that most of us are pleased or satisfied with the fact that that's what's happening in housing. Um, is there anything that I'm missing or something that we'd like to add to that? Um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but that's because I have a small head. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it seems like, yes, we can stop talking about this. Uh, a number of good things are happening. Uh, we're pleased with what I'm pleased with what's happening. Um, I'm curious to see what the conversation will lead to in the fall, but back to what was mentioned earlier by a couple of my colleagues in relation to, you know, help with, with town gown. Um, we're going to start a series of uh, hopefully fruitful conversations in the fall related to exactly that kind, those kinds of questions. So that's again, to my view, progress and encouraging. Okay. Uh, Paul. So one other thing is um, some things come up and we didn't expect it. So the state law on ADUs, accessory dwelling units. Now we have to put a lot of effort into that now because we do have a bylaw. We need to bring it into compliance with the state law. That's something the council will have to have to adopt. We have six months to do it. So it, it is a, it's going to require some speed in, in, in essence. And we will be doing this without a planning director at this moment in time. Hopefully we'll have one in soon enough to, get that to the council mm -hmm. successfully but you know we we now have an external um imperative that's presented itself that we 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 don't want to have two adu bylaws one's a state law one a, a local law we want to be in compliance with this state law okay are there any other comments mindy joe i mean i'm sorry councillor haneke um just in response to Councillor Ryan, everything that was named is not a measure. It's all projects that came to the town from other locations. And I guess I, so that's a lot of, and that's not taking away from anything that's happened with any of them. It's been great that we are creating all of those, those housing opportunities and those are being created in town. My concern is our planning department doesn't appear to always be planning. They seem to be very reactive to proposals that are brought to them. Um, 
partially because there's not a lot of funding for the planning department to be able to do it all. <laughs> Again, it, it comes down to money, right? And so when when I argued to reword these to be proposed measures, I was hoping to encourage the planning department to do more planning as part of the, and, and the manager to have the planning department do a little more planning and put a little more resources to planning. But if we don't give any ideas or any very, you know, clearer, I feel like if we don't give clearer directions as to where we want that planning to go, it makes it harder for the manager. And I understand the planning department in response to Pat and I's proposal that was then withdrawn last year with the planning board has been doing some actual proactive planning and that is good. And we should be seeing that hopefully in the next month or two um, to be able to respond to and talk about. I would love to see more of that proactive planning um, so that we're not just relying on when we re when we evaluate the manager on the projects that were brought to the town that they helped shepherd through, but that we also look at what has the town done proactively to plan for a town that is changing and how we want it and to guide how we want that town to change because of the external forces that are coming in and how we respond to that so that we do it proactively. So the things that I've heard just with regard to zoning, I mean, I'm sorry, just regard to how affording affordable housing is that we have several projects in process. Some of those are opportunistic. For example, Ball Lane, money became available for home ownership. We jumped on it. Belchertown Road and East Street School, same thing. We have two things we know are coming up. One is the need to bring our ADU bylaw into compliance with the new state bylaw. And the other one is the planning board's effort on the overlay district. The only other thing that was suggested as any other kinds of actions that I'm hearing was some kind of bylaw. And that would take a lot of work from the planning department to come forward with that. Are there any other comments or anything else people want to add to this particular area? Councilor Ette. It isn't so much a... It's not so much a question. It isn't so much a question as a maybe some clarification. Um, when it says that Balding project is deeply affordable but can take seven years, does that mean it's deeply affordable today, or will it also be deeply affordable even in seven years? But what's the what's the seven years there? Mm -hmm. Those are wonderful questions with no answers. <laughs> are there other comments on this particular goal? Pam. I was just going to respond to that question. I think the, the town manager could probably explain generally that that someone buys into that project and then if they go to sell it there are stipulations if they go to sell it it remains an affordable at the time of sale to the next person who is also income qualified and so there is a continuity and a um, there's a there's a uh, there are sideboards on how much the the um, a, a unit can be sold for and I'm not giving a I didn't mean to tell the explanation. Anyway, it, it's intended to remain affordable in the sense that it is a percentage of someone's income to buy it. Does that help? I think it does, because I was thinking based on that reading that it would take the project seven years to come to completion. But what you're saying is something 
different from that. It's not the length of time for the project, but um, the affordability, even if other owners, sure. Okay. Are there any other comments on this call? What I also heard tonight was that at some point we might not spend a full hour, but to look at any of the other goals uh, besides climate action, uh, which we'll look at on the 9th uh, and see if there's any other discussion we wanna have. And so I will try to fit that into the agenda as we go through over the next couple of week, uh, months. What this does do, by the way, is set the stage for setting goals for the coming year. And many of those goals may be here because in fact, they are multi-year goals. And in many instances, as uh, Andy pointed out, they're not just multi-year, but they were goals that were set by previous counselors. I can give you an example. DPW and fire weren't even a goal that was set by this council. It was a goal that came to us from a previous select board. And we still haven't achieved that. So, uh, Pam? Can we um, ask GOL in the discussion that they have to um, actually talk about how to try to um, get in sync with the annual cycle? Because it just, we're, we're off by half a year. We always get reporting for less than a full year, and I would love to have it happen in a timely manner. Anna, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I mean, GOL can discuss it. I think the question, I don't know if it's a question for the council or a question for GOL of do we either only give ourselves a half a year next time or do we not have any goals for a half a year, right? Like where do we, how do we do that catch up? Um, but GOL was hoping to discuss this process. This is something that we need to discuss and then our schedule got filled up. So um, much like the council is having this discussion uh, from the retreat. So it is absolutely something GOL can discuss on how to get on the right calendar. Cause I agree it's off. Are there any other comments? Mandy, Councillor Hanneke. So I guess depends on what you mean by off. <laughs> um, we, the very first council took over the select board's evaluation cycle where we evaluated in July and August mm -hmm. and did all of the surveys in July and August and adopted goals around that time um, at the beginning of a fiscal year. And then after a year or two, the council, that first very first session, um, made a decision that end of year, beginning of year, because the council turns over at that time, might make a little more sense. So I'm not saying one is better than the other, but it do you look at it based on the council's terms or the fiscal year? or the manager's contract, um, no matter what, you're always only going to get a self-evaluation that is shorter than 12 months because you are asking for that months before you're adopting a new one, unless every year you wait 12 months and then you move and you really only do it every 14 or so. Um, although I would, if, if we're gonna go into that conversation, I would love for GOL to discuss how we can shorten the time frame between the manager submitting the self evaluation and us submitting the uh, adopting the evaluation document and adopting the next year's manager goals cuz the shorter we can make that the longer mm -hmm. we have the, the more time there is between to to see what's actually happened and interestingly enough councilor haneke last year um we did shorten we us, we sliced an entire month off of it, but it's still in this odd sink. And uh, there has, it wasn't in this council, but at least in the previous one, I believe, a because I can probably go back and find my chart where I tried to bring the whole thing into sync. Uh, there has been that discussion and we can revisit it again in GOL. Are there any other comments on this? Okay. Um, 
I'm going to then move on to our action item. Uh, it is a proposal for transportation and parking commission charge and amendments to the town council policy on the control and regulation of the public ways. I wanna point out that the actual action in this case is a referral. Um, and so unless um, the council doesn't want to refer it, I'm going to, um, even if you don't wanna refer it, you just vote no. So I'm going to begin with the motion and then we're going to go with a presentation briefly from the town manager and council discussion. And that council discussion would particularly focus on the kinds of things that we want the body to which it's being referred to focus on. So the motion is to refer the proposed transportation and parking commission charge and amendments to the town council policy to the town council policy on the control and regulation of the public ways to the town services and outreach committee with subsequent review for clarity, consistency and actionability by the gov governance organization and legislation committee with reports to the town council by October 21st, 2024. Is there a second? Second, Rooney. Okay. So, um, town manager Bachelman, please. Thank you, Lynn. So the, as you said, this is a proposal to establish a new commission uh, th that is currently proposed to be named the Transportation and Parking Commission. Um, I presented to this to you previously, and you came back and said, well, give us something more tangible, develop a charge, and tell us what the amendments to the policy um, on public ways would be, and give us more information. And so that's what I'm presenting to you tonight. Um, the why are we even talking about this? I think one of the in the memo we talk about the frustration that residents have had in terms of how do I get something considered by the town when I want to see something it, uh, in changed in a public way. Um, and the second goal is that I think for the town council, um, there are a number of items that come before you, especially like utility poles and things like that that can absorb an enormous amount of time of the council. Um, and the process for the council is that for many items that comes into a, a change to a public way, comes to the council, it, get re it gets referred to the TSO committee, which then asks for the advice from the Disability Access Advisory Committee and the Transportation Advisory Committee, which then goes back to, to the TSO committee and then comes back to the council. And it's a it's a cumbersome process. And if you are the advocate for whatever change you're at, you're suggesting, you feel obligated to attend each one of those meetings to make sure your um, your goal is your your proposal is being heard appropriately, and that seems to be a very cumbersome process. We looked at what um, uh, we looked at two things. One was how do other cities similar to ours um, handle transportation and parking committee uh, th these issues? And we looked at over fifty, and there's a chart that has been added, hopefully, to your um, packet that you can review and with links to how other cities have done that, done this. Um, and, uh, and also we looked at the towns uh, in the town charter created a licensing, licensing commission, which really established a process for addressing liquor and other licenses. And those are things that previously had been held by the select board. A special commission was, was created and that seems to have worked really well. It hasn't created the, any kinds of they handle very difficult things, even suspensions of liquor licenses and things like that, but it seems to be very functional. So that's sort of our model. Can we get to something that's more functional? Um, so um, the goal of this is to help both the residents who are asking for changes, and we anticipate there'll be a lot more changes coming forward with traffic calming and things like that. Is there... Uh, and is there a, way, a better way for the council to make the ultimate final decision? Or is it, and the ultimate question for the council is, are you willing to delegate some of your responsibility? Remember that all of your, all the public way responsibilities lie with the council per the charter. Are you willing to give up some of that or to delegate that to a new commission? And that's what's being proposed to you tonight. Um, the, the idea on this for this group is that they would, um, it reorganize our public way decision making to provi pr uh, provide clarity and transparency for, for proposals. 
it would have a group that has its mission as being a town-wide uh, overview of the transportation systems and as, as opposed to the individual, you know, I want a crosswalk in front of my house type things. Um, I think it will create more efficiency and then it will promote, as some councilors have already talked about other for housing, more, um, more coherent planning uh, through a, a dedicated body. Um, the proposal is to include professional staff uh, on this committee, uh, which is many of the committees that are uh, like Northampton, they have professional staff that serve on these committees. And to have that technical expertise uh, be in conversation with members of the public. Um, so this idea is to is really to ask you if you are interested in having this conversation, you can say, yes, let's have this conversation. Or you can say, no, we're happy the way things are. If you say yes, then we will have this conversation likely at TSO. Um, if you say no, then we would, I would come back to you with some recommendations for how to bolster the role of both, both the uh, Transportation Advisory Committee and the DAAC, because you seem to d depend on those two committees and for professional staff. So that's the question before you. Do you want to, do you want to pursue this model, which um, one, one op option is to delegate some of your authority to another body. So for instance, if someone is looking to put a utility pole up, you would say, we don't want to have the public hearing. We don't need to have that in front of us. We want this commission to make that decision. Some deci some things that you might want to reserve for yourself, which I, which I think um, would, is probable, like uh, anything that with any permanent structure on the town common, say, you, that's, that's something that would reside with the town council. Um, I have reviewed this with uh, extensively with the chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee and also um, have met with the Transportation Advisory Committee and they, they are excited about this as a way of clarifying their role uh, because I think there's some frustration. I think we've heard it from the, from the TAC in terms of what is our role? Do we handle things that are just delegated to us? Are we proactive in planning? So that's the, that's the idea behind this. Um, and I, I think a, you could have a very robust discussion at TSO to sort of unpack what it all means um, in terms of the relationship between TSO and this committee and things like that. Before I move to questions, I want to acknowledge that Jennifer Taub has joined us. Jennifer, can you hear us? I can. Thank you. And let the record show that Jennifer joined us at 732. Uh, thank you. Uh, so the floor is open for questions at this point before we move on to any vote. Kathy. Um, I, I'm in favor of this, so I want to just start with that statement. So my question is, if we have some specifics um, on the way the charge is written and the composition, at this point, do we send them to both Paul and the chair of TSO is the question. Because I also did look at what Northampton's doing. And just as part of my comment is many of the commissions, not all, but the ones that are called commissions have one or two counselors on it. So there is uh, someone on there that actually uh, has to get reelected at some point, isn't just a staff person or isn't appointed by the town manager. So some have that. And then the list of what we're delegating, um, there are some that I don't think it's completely clear. So do I just type up both questions on content? So the last thing I just want to say, I think it's excellent that we'd be moving in this direction, especially when I see things like clear, consistent processes because we haven't had them on where, what door do you go through? We, we put people through different doors. Um, so I think having a, 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 those would be great. And I also think we need some policy, whether they're manuals, Northampton has a few of them, but um, what do we mean by traffic, traffic common, which areas or priorities, a roadmap to where they would happen. So I would think this body would do that, but it's the same staff, Paul, that you've got staffing everything now. <laughs> so I don't think 
the new volunteers will necessarily be writing policy manuals. So that those are, so do I just type all of this up and then send it to, to both um, the TSO counselors and I mean, to the chair and to, I guess, Paul. That's yes. my main question. And, and yes, you do. And you should CC the president of the council. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Haneke. Um, I have some similar concerns about the membership proposal. Um, and I will state that I don't know where I stand on the creation of this to begin with, but um, the I have concerns about the membership, not just the lack of a counselor, given the spreadsheet we got that normally had at least one counselor on those, especially those that had actual action authority, um, but also the specificity of the resident members and what they need to come with. Um, when I and Councillor Devlin Gauthier were sponsoring some changes to the public ways regarding lighting on the public ways, um, I think it's beneficial to have members that do not have a singular focus on just pedestrian safety or just travel um, that can also step back and look at the wider picture of how, I'm just gonna use streetlights as an example, how streetlights affect the people who live around those streetlights, not just how they affect the people who are using the public way. Um, and I worry that the resident membership here on composition is a little bit too focused to one area. Um, I had some questions regarding the actual proposal of the decision-making authority um, under reservation of public ways parking, the long-term requests, um, that delegation in the charge seems to conflict with the proposed change in the policy on public ways, since in the policy section 2B2, the council retains jurisdiction of all but seasonal long-term requests for up to eight spots, yet the charge seems to delegate all long-term parking requests, not just the seasonal ones. Um, so what is the goal surrounding delegation of long-term parking requests? Um, are you aiming to delegate or ask us to delegate those for, the one I could think of easily was parking, parking reservations regarding construction projects like there was on Spring Street and stuff is one I thought of that would fall under that nebulous area that in the charge seems to be delegated, but in the policy does not. Um, uh, permanent or other requests, um, would the council retain authority to create a policy for considering requests regarding permanent changes um, to parking permits, whether they're required or not in certain areas, whether there is no parking on a street, could we create a policy to consider those but delegate the change of, you know, the actual changing of them to someone else. Um, Long-term closures under reservations of sidewalks and road closures, signage and seating. Um, the proposal in the charge is to delegate them all. Um, so I'm wondering whether that is a proposal to also delegate essentially permanent closures to sidewalks and streets. Um, the most recent, well, I don't know whether it's most recent, it happened before I moved here, but there was a closure of the Woodside Avenue bridge over the rail trail at some point in time. Um, if something like that would happen in the future, would this charge and change to the policy actually delegate that decision to the Parking and Transportation Committee? And is that something the council wants to delegate or is it just long-term but not permanent. <laughs> we hadn't distinguished that in the current policy, the long-term versus permanent. Um, and then is there, how would we define what a major roadway and sidewalk redesign is that under here remains with the council? Um, and then I noticed that the traffic control section in this charge has no equivalent in the policy. Um, so that was a question there. I also, for TSO's, thinking, um, 
when looking at the chart, thank you for the Excel spreadsheet, whichever staff member created that Excel spreadsheet on commissions, thank you. I noticed that that spreadsheet seemed to imply that about 50% of the cities do not have any parking commissions. So it probably remains with the council um, that about 25% have created some that the council or whoever has designated the actual acting authority to but that the other 25% or so have recommendation authority to the town council. So it's not necessarily as popular to hand away that authority as I think some of the memos seems to imply um, if it's 25% of cities versus 50 or 75%. So another thing for TSO to think about is do we wanna be in that minority or I, is handing the authority away necessary versus handing the, could we potentially delegate the hearing, the public hearing, like we've done to other committees to a commission um, and the full recommendation so that the recommendation doesn't come from say TSO, it comes from a commission. Um, as, as I think through this and looking at some of the charts that were on there, but leave the actual vote to the council potentially or the manager you actually was taking away one of your delegated authorities from you and moving it to the commission um you know i i would just ask the tso look at other options what i do appreciate from all of this given those questions i want to say i appreciate we absolutely need clarity for the residents on how the process works and right now i think there isn't, there's too many committees that are dealing with stuff. There's too many places. And so even if it's a recommending body, if we take that, that recommendation away from TSO and move to this one to sort of create complete clarity, that I do absolutely support. I just don't know what the best method of creating that clarity is. And can we assume that you're gonna put your questions into writing? Thank you. Uh, Pam? Thank you. Um, I agree with what Mandy said, uh, especially just thinking about the makeup of the of the committee. I also uh, interested to see that there might be a counselor, or possibly it would be appropriate to have a counselor on a committee such as this. Um, in any case, as TSO looks at it, that the charge should be matching the policy, and I think it's probably more important to have the, the charge match the policy, then the policy try to match the charge. Um, the thinking about the permanent changes, I in in general, I support the idea of this commission. On permanent changes in the public way, um, and these are listed in policy items 2D, 3C, II, and 3G. Um, these the permanent uh, delegation of authority to a, a commission is doesn't make me very comfortable, um, and I think there needs to be a pretty good discussion on what components could be T S T P C and which should remain with the council. Um, I would also ask uh, T S O to think about. Um, the the requirement of a public hearing and that again in the case of of permanent structures permanent changes in the uh in the public right of way um which which ones really need um not a sign probably but yes a bus shelter i mean which ones need public hearings there was some really important um feedback from neighbors uh, at a ZBA hearing on 798 800 North Pleasant Street. And it had to do with a duplex that was being proposed, but as part of that, uh, the location of a bus shelter was discussed at great length and it was adjusted because of the feedback that, they, that the DPW received from the neighbors. So I think public hearings are, are usually very, very positive. Um, and and could there be some uh, address of 
traffic safety zones. I know traffic safety zones falls um, well within the purview of probably this commission, but I think it's um, I still want I still want a list of all the the traffic problem areas in town and make sure that we have priorities set for for um, repairing those. And again, I'll write my notes up and send them to TSO. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, yes, I agree with much of what's been said. Um, I would feel more comfortable if there was a counselor represented and I on the commission. Um, and I also agree that I also found the requirements for the residents to be a little too specific, um, that they almost had to be professionals um, in the field. And I know you want expertise to some extent, but as Councillor Haneke said, you also want um, those who may be Im impacted or that can bring that perspective, the resident perspective to the commission. Um, I think I would feel better if the commission had more recommending policy and make recommendations than final decisions. I would certainly feel comfortable with a commission making a decision about utility polls, but I think, as I said, when this was first brought to us in the last council session, there's just, you know, there's a, a world between utility polls and, let's say, a downtown parking structure. And I don't know if it was envisioned that that level of decision making would be with the commission, but I think, you know, something like that should stay with the council. Um, so I would, I'm a member of TSO, but I would want to address in TSO, and I hope that the referral isn't so specific that TSO could still really um, discuss and come back with recommendations about what this, what decision making powers the uh, commission would have versus what they recommend versus what would be their final decision. Because while the who's ever in the town manager position, I don't see it so much as that position giving up power because the person in that position selects the members of the commission. So I do have a concern that this body not be so many steps removed from residents and the voters, but I we could take that up in TSO. So that that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Ette. Um, I've heard, I think, in this discussion several times, the expression permanent delegation, which to me seems two words that don't shouldn't go together. Um, so perhaps my question is, in the event of delegation, is there always the possibility of the town council taking that authority back if perhaps it turns out that the commission isn't working as efficiently as it is supposed to do? Um, my, my response to that question is you can always reverse an action as long as the state law allows you to, to do it. Um, the, but I do think you need to give something a reasonable amount of time. That wasn't why I raised my hand. Um, I look upon a committee like this as an opportunity for citizen engagement in very meaningful ways. I think we need to find more of, of those opportunities. I think of the success of the Board of License Commissioners. I'm not clear that this council truly understands the unbelievable amount of work that board removed from the council. If you were on a previous select board as Andy was, and as my husband was, you would sometimes wonder if that was your only role was to deal with license, liquor licenses and the consequences. So before we resist, quote, giving something up, let's think about empowering residents to participate in a way that's meaningful, which brings me to my next point, And that is that if we retain the decision-making authority on um, things that then come back and are recommended to us after a committee has spent an enormous amount of time, 
I don't want to see us rubber stamp, but I also don't want to see us spending a lot of time second guessing where they've already spent a lot of time. So it's how do you create a committee like this, allow it to grow with its wings that it needs, evaluate its impact on the work of the council and the benefits to the town, and then make a decision on a regular basis whether it will continue. So I'm hoping that as the TSO looks at that, they keep some of those kind of larger goals in mind. Councillor, I'm gonna to go to Pat DeAngelis and then back to Councillor Haneke. Uh, yeah, I've been thinking about uh, the residents uh, and people feeling like uh, they're being um, boxed in or they have to have a specific experience. But it says three residents with interests or backgrounds and then it lists transportation, equity, public transit, pedestrian and bicycle transportation. And I can think of 10 people in town who are not professional designers or traffic people or whatever, but um, the Cairns bike from Amherst to Northampton to work every day. They have lived experience. Um, and I think that's included in here. So I think that there's, um, I'm much more concerned that everything's political that we do, even when we pretend it's not. Uh, and I don't want decisions being made because this person lives there, or this person lives here. I want decisions made based on a person's interest and experience. And I have a wider sense of what experience consists of than maybe some of us who think this is uh, limiting. Thank you. Councillor Haneke. Councillor Ette brought up a good point. Um, it's unclear who would adopt the charge, but if it's not the council that adopts the charge, does the council have the ability to modify the charge if it modifies the policy on public ways? Because we adopt the policy, but if we would to change that, but we haven't adopted the charge because the charge was adopted by the manager, and I don't know what the intent is on who adopts the charge, but that will need to be cleared on cleared up at TSO as to who would be adopting the charge and how that would work if it is not at the council for adoption. Good point, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, then let's move to a vote. The vote is to refer the proposed Transportation and Parking Commission charge and amendments to the Town Council policy on the control and regulation of the public ways to the Town Services and Outreach Committee with subsequent review for clarity, consistency, and actionability by Governance Organization and Legislation Committee with reports to the Town Council by October 21st, 2024. It's been made and seconded. Let me point out that giving a date is a way of saying this is what we would like, but it may be that that's a progress report. It doesn't always mean that you've finished your work. I'm going to begin the vote in this case with Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councilor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councilor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councilor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councilor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. And Pat DeAngelis. Aye. It's unanimous. We're going to take a 10 minute break and come back and complete our meeting. Uh, we will recon reconvene at 810. Please turn off your mics and your video and turn your video back on when you return. Thank you.
As you return, please turn your video back on. And I'm gonna ask the, the um, clerk of the town council to take the notice down. You had said 810, Lynn, so people might still be making their way back to 808. Right. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we're going to uh, go ahead. I'm going to place the motion regarding the appointment for the finance committee on the table, the appointments, um, and look, for, seek a second. To appoint the following non-voting finance committee members, Bernie Kubiak for a term to expire June 30th, 2025, Thomas Avery Porter for a term to expire June 30th, 2026. Is there a second? Second. Whoa. Thank you. I can have it. Are there any? Uh, Anna, as chair of GOL, um, would you please give us a brief report? Absolutely. So I prepped a memo that's in your packets. Um, this was pretty straightforward. We were really grateful for everyone who submitted materials for the these two openings that we had. I want to just make sure folks know those two uh, terms are different. There's a one-year term and a two-year term, essentially. Um, and we were able to reappoint longtime uh, member Bernie Kubiak um, and a newcomer, Tom Porter, to those roles. The votes were unanimous coming out of GOL with two members absent on the day that we voted. Both of these folks bring significant professional experience to the roles, and uh, the committee agreed would do uh, would do a, a, an excellent job taking into account all of the needs of finance committee. Happy to answer any... questions as well. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Bob Hagner. I, I just want to um, enthusiastically support both these nominees. Um, I've worked with Bernie for a couple of years now. He's uh, very knowledgeable about local government. And I actually know Tom Porter. Um, he used to be a neighbor of mine. Um, he's, a, I believe, a native son of Amherst. So he, and he brings a, a financial background. So he would be very good for this, for the committee. Thank you. Kathy Shane. Um, I also support both candidates. I just have a question and I should know the answer on this because I've been on finance ever since the council started. But is the maximum term we could do two years or can we do three? Because one of the things I've really liked about the non-residents, the non-voting residents, is how much they learn and how quickly they learn. And I think that knowledge spanning council terms is useful. So it may not be the time to question this, but I would like to revisit whether we could make these three-year terms. Um, so if it's not now, but in the future, because I think... Um, their potential source for new counselors, witness Bob Hagner, but it, it takes a while to to learn this and not to have to resubmit for this. So that, that's the only question I have of us. Would we consider three-year terms? 
Kathy, if I, if I might, um, well, the, we, I think that's a really valid question. I will note that by the nature of the term, um, expiration dates here, we have staggered appointments now. So, um, at the very least we, we aren't losing two at the same time. We'll always have kind of one per year with the two-year term. So I agree. That's a really valid, um, really valid thing for the council to discuss if, if we're allowed to, and I'm excited to see that they're not expiring at the same time. Yeah, no, and I agree. I'm, I'm just so I'm not raising it for, for these two, but just noting to me, there's no particular reason to have it expire in 2026. So if we going forward can think of are these potentially three year terms, I think it's healthy for all of us to have that. Thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none, I'm going to move to the vote. Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. It is unanimous. Um, the next is a motion that was postponed. It's to appoint Lawrence Klutz to the planning board for a term beginning immediately and ending June 30th, 2027. Councilor Haneke, you originally made this motion. I'd like to ask if you'd like to speak to this motion at this time. I spoke to it last meeting. I have no need to add. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Anna? Um, I have a brief disclosure. I work in the same building as Mr. Klutz, and but we do not work closely together. I barely know him at all. Uh, and I do not believe that I have a true conflict of interest in this uh, vote, but wanted to share that disclosure at this time. Thank you. Pam? Thank you. I, I did not speak during the um, round of discussion last time, and I just had felt that it was not appropriate as chair of the CRC, um, I wanted to reiterate that um, we had a we had a good discussion about the candidates. The candidates were were equal essentially that many people had stated that they felt that you know we had two good choices. Um, and I think the um, what was never discussed is the fact that um, in my perspective, the skills that Melissa Ferris brought to the table were that she spoke uh, well about her ability to read site plans, to read architectural drawings, and that um, she, she uses that skill regularly in support of her husband's work. And to me, as a visual person, as, as a landscape architect, as someone who has to read plans for information. Um, that's a critical skill. Not every not everyone on the planning board has that skill. When you can find someone that has a skill like that, it's it's very important. And I I didn't speak up last time. I thought I should have, but it but the conversation had gone on so long. I I didn't. Um, so I I wanted to strongly support Melissa Ferris. Um, additionally, she brings some gender balance to that group, and we Point are of losing, order. We are losing the, a female. The motion on the floor is not about Melissa Ferris, and that motion was defeated a month ago. That is true. Is there anything else you'd like to say, Pam? No, I've been cut off sufficiently. Thank you. Kathy? Yes, I, I will speak to the motion since I'm the one who postponed it, as Mandy pointed out, for a month. I was appalled by the process that led to this, um, and I will be abstaining tonight um, on this particular motion. Uh, we, we During the CRC, I went back and I rewatched the interview after our last meeting, and I reread the SOI. And I just want to remind everyone that the word neighbors and neighborhood is in our 
code. It's in the planning code in both section 10 and section 11. So we expect people to speak to it, not to the exclusion of other things. And I was really shocked at an attack um, that seemed to be fairly well orchestrated. And actually the first person who spoke was in favor, tried to substitute the person we're voting on tonight, didn't, didn't, acknowledge that they had recruited that person and that there's a neighbor, they are their neighbor. So I just think we need to be much more careful with our process. Um, we, we do need people who have read our planning law, who have read our master plan. And as Pam just said, I think we urgently need people with some skill sets. It can be a mix, Pat. It doesn't have to be everyone comes with the skill set, but we're not getting civil engineers. We're not getting a planner. We're not getting another architect. So it'd be great if we can recruit some of those people. So I just think we need to be much more um, in tune with uh, what people are both reading into the fact of what a planning board needs to do and a zoning board needs to do. They need to be considerate, considering neighborhoods, but not to the exclusion of everything else. So um, I think it's unfortunate we're at this place and I don't like to abstain, but I'm abstaining in protests for the process that we just had. Andy. No, I appreciate uh, the fact that Kathy um, at the last meeting um, exercised her right to postpone I was very uncomfortable that night with the way the discussion had flowed and uh, uh, I needed some time to think about it and I uh, appreciated the fact that uh, Kathy's action provided that opportunity. I think that I was really troubled by the process. We really had two, uh, two good people, actually three good people to be honest because we already approved one three good people who had been accepted by the committee and it, they said that we had a sufficient uh, group to move forward with and um, did the interviews. I watched the interviews um, and uh, it was not a, uh, um, it was a close vote. I mean, we're talking about a two, three or three, two vote, however you want to um, characterize what that vote was. It was not, um, it, it was as close as you can get within a committee uh, and not an overwhelming vote as we um, often have, like uh, just a moment ago when we had a unanimous vote of all present in recommending the finance committee people that were there. I think that what I would like to see, um, because this has happened twice, is... Um, a real re-examination of what our process is for how interviews take place, um, how issues can be brought forward in the interview process, because this is the second time, the other one being a ZBA appointment, where the council ended up having a substantial discussion that was really um, a new discussion at the council and not a, dis and not a continuation of a discussion that apparently happened during interview process and uh, uh, did not give the applicant in either of the situations an opportunity to um, answer questions about what uh, was being discussed and what the concerns were that were being expressed by the council, including by me. Um, and so I hope that we take this um, opportunity to reflect on what has happened in this um, process and think about what um, we do, how we do it, and how we might improve it to make for a more robust, meaningful interview um, and selection process so that it's really fair to the candidates and encourages people to continue to apply to serve on boards that are approved by this council. Um, having said all of that, I'm going to be voting yes, because I believe that uh, it wasn't a question of whether Mr. Klaus was uh, 
qualified or not that led us to all of the turmoil in the last meeting. I was just unhappy with that uh, last meeting. Jennifer? Um, yes, I will be abstaining as well because I don't want to vote no for Mr. Klutz. I think that we had two uh, pretty equally um, and well-qualified candidates. So, um, but I was very concerned about the process. Um, I'm particularly concerned because this has come up before that we would hold somebody's prior public comment or the fact that they came and offered public comment as an abutter. Um, I think uh, Pam may have um, referred to uh, in the special permit um, section, uh, it's article 10 and there's various sections that literally speak to section you know 10.385 that reasonably protect protects we we ask for public comment because we want to know we want to get to what reasonably protects the adjoining premises against detrimental or effect um offensive uses section 10.383 we want to not we we want to be sure that something is not a substantial inconvenience to abutters, vehicles, and pedestrians, and, and the list goes on. And if you live in, for example, a general residence district, as I do, throughout the year, I regularly receive abutters notices because I live in a neighborhood where there are not infrequently developments that require a special permit. And if someone happens to and that and so candidates from those districts should not be disadvantaged because they are abutters and they do offer public comment because public comment is asked of them. If you happen to live in a more exclusively zoned district where special permits are there's it's rare that a special permit is asked for a development in your neighborhood so that you're not receiving abutters notices that shouldn't give you position you to have a better chance of being selected for the ZBA or the planning board because of where you live and because you live in a place where, again, you're not in the butter. So I, and as um, Councillor Haneke said in talking about the Transportation and Parking Commission, that she would want the residents appointed that would be appointed to live around streetlights and bring that lived experience. So lived experience of applies to all kinds of developments. We can't really pick and choose which apply to us. So I, uh, again, um, am concerned about, there seems to be on the part of some counselors a, or an assumption that if you're in a butter, you should not be um, looking out <laughs> for you, that, or that if you, um, offer public comment that that comment or a letter you've written to the council can then be used against you if you um, apply uh, for a town board or committee just because you are speaking from the position of an abutter. And that came up, has come up several times on the planning when we're interviewing candidates for the planning board and for the ZBA. Thank you. Pat. Thank you. Um, I support Lawrence Klutz. I supported him at the uh, CRC meeting where we voted, and I supported him at the last council meeting. He lives across the street, basically, in the same district. It's that funny little split of three and four. He lives on Dana Street, and she lives on Lincoln Avenue. Not that different. Um, but the other thing... Uh, I also want to say, I don't join forces and orchestrate uh, what I'm going to do. I sometimes wish I did, but I don't do that uh, to the chagrin of some of my colleagues. Um, so I, I don't particularly like that that was stated, but I'll live with it. We do, Andy and others, need to reexamine the process. It doesn't really work. But what happened here is that a committee voted three to two to make a specific recommendation for two people. One of those people proceeded. The other person, there was a discussion by a council and a decision not to have her serve at this time. 
That's the process. That's part of the process because a committee makes a recommendation doesn't mean the council has to live by that recommendation. But that's not the most important thing. The most important thing were some of the things that Mr. Klutz said during the interview and also in his statement of interest. And you know, I, I highlighted several things, but I'm just, he, he really talked about advocating for sustainable development practices, promoting affordable housing options, or supporting initiatives that promote cultural um, diversity and inclusion. Neither of the other two candidates spoke to those issues. Those are issues that are extremely important to me. And it surprised me that it wasn't important to more people on the council. Reading plans is an important skill. But being able to collaborate and communicate and strategize is also critically important. Another thing that upset some people was that Mr. Klutz had the audacity to say that we need to reach out to abutters. We need to reach out to the community to get as much feedback as a board or a committee as they possibly can. But ultimately, the decision belongs to the board. And that didn't sit well with some people. But that's the job, to listen, to decide. to. And I think he has the skills to do that. And I hope that people will vote for him this evening. Thank you. Councillor Haneke. I support everything that Councillor DeAngelo said. I just wanted to add a few more things. I think there's a misunderstanding of what happens after the interview questions are asked within a committee. Because once the interview questions are asked and answered in full, all of the interviewees, the applicants, are moved into the audience. And the committee during the discussion, no matter what comes up, never, the policy does not allow us to bring those applicants back in and ask them to clarify anything at all. So what happened at the council meeting a month ago with questions arising and desires there and, and what people are saying is should have happened of, well, we're uncomfortable discussing it because the candidates can't respond. Well, they can't respond in the committee either because that's our policy. We did nothing differently at the council than what would have happened at the committee. And that did happen at the committee because we had those discussions at the committee and those disagreements and those questions came up. If you want it modified, we have a policy. Propose a redlined, changed version of that policy. Bring it to the council. Get it referred to GOL. I want to comment that lived experience, as Councillor Taub, Jennifer Taub was saying, is much different than a predetermined outcome and a predetermined decision when you're on a judicial body and a quasi-judicial body as to who you will equate more weight to or who you would follow on their opinions or their recommendations without considering everything else. Lived experience is absolutely important, but you have to come in with an open mind and an ability to look at what is brought in front of you in your quasi-judicial decision-making role and make the decision based on that, not on predetermined and pre-announced things. And Mr. Klutz, in his interviews, as Councillor D'Angelo said, admitted that and said it's important to hear everything, but we got to go with what's in front of us and whether it meets the bylaw or not. And it's a, and particularly with public opinion, it's an important contributing factor, but you have to base your decisions on sound policy and long-term considerations. That's one of the things that makes me support him. The other thing that he said that made me support him 
and I think that would make him a fantastic planning board member, is that he spoke of the cautiousness about things regarding exceptions and waivers and that you need to look at whether it supports the goals of the master plan, the documents the towns have adopted. But you also have to be practical and say, if we're always granting one of these in one particular area, maybe it's time to relook at the zoning bylaw and say, have times changed and do we have to modify the law? We don't do enough of relooking at our laws based on times changed. And so I, I thought his practical approach to that issue was very important to have on the planning board. Is there anything else, Councilor Haneke? Jennifer? Jennifer, you need to unmute. Right, I'm sorry. I did not hear um, Ms. Ferris say anything that would suggest that she came with a predetermined decision or outcome. I thought both candidates um, were very thoughtful. And again, they were not that far apart. I, um, but I, and I very much heard Ms. Ferris say, I just have to, that she was very concerned about affordable housing and workforce housing, that we needed more of that in Amherst. So she was in no way not speaking to the need for more of the kind of housing that, that we don't have now. Um, and there is a difference between Dana Street and across and south, I'm sorry, north of Amity. Uh, Dana Street is a residential zone neighborhood residence. North of Amity is zone general residence. And one has those who live in the general residence area have many more um, applications coming before that neighborhood for a special permit. So they're in a very different situation. And again, are much more likely to receive abutters notices than those living in the RN neighborhood. So they may be close together, but they have different zoning and that makes for a very different neighborhood. Um, and as I said, I'm going to abstain because I don't want to vote no for Mr. Klutz. I think both candidates are well qualified and similarly qualified one has lived in Amherst, one grew, grew up in the area and has lived here longer, and she brings that um, familiarity with the to the town to, to a position on the planning board. But um, I'm concerned that one candidate is being portrayed differently than her answers, than what her answers um, suggested. Anna. Um, this vote is requires a majority present voting in favor. And while I respect all counselors right to vote how they please, I think a protest abstention uh, abstention is a darn shame because it's a no vote. And um, come on, I see the faces folks are making. It is. It's a majority present voting in favor. That means unless you're voting in favor, it's not it's it's not just an abstention. We faced this before with appointments, I believe, to the planning board. And so I think it's just it's important to note that if you are in objection to this candidate, then you should vote no. But I don't see an abstention as adequately challenging this process. I think that if people are challenged by the way this process has occurred, that has come out through discussion, which has been very helpful and insightful, but also would come about through counselors proposing changes to the process going forward. I don't see um, protest, protest abstentions as, as helpful nor productive in this instance. And I hope folks just really consider what that means for this particular vote. Um, I think I was not here for the original discussion on these uh, on these actions, but it does seem like there is general consensus from members of CRC that we didn't have any bad candidates, um, that we had folks who were qualified for this role. And so I plan on supporting this motion based on the materials I've seen uh, and the meetings that I've watched recordings of. But I just wanted to, to make sure that that vote quantum was clearly noted. It's in the motions sheet as well, that it's a majority present voting in favor. Then point of, point of order. Yes. Um, I just want to clarify that um, 
I was told that we couldn't talk about Ms. Ferris because she's not the one we're voting on tonight. Can can you kindly give us a recap of when she was eliminated essentially from competition um, if, if Mr. Klutz is voted down, let's say does not get the majority that he needs, are we able to go back to the, the drawing board and say, now we have two candidates. We're going to talk about Ms. Ferris and Mr. Klutz. And I would like some clarification on that I as, believe as that, a result of this vote. I believe that if we vote Mr. Klutz down, we send this back to CRC and they need to start the process all over. That would be my interpretation. Um, I'm going to raise my hand and just, um, I, abstain, I abstained on the last uh, vote um, against with great criticism from my colleagues. Um, I did not feel prepared at that point to make that switch very fast. I have since gone back and looked at the tapes. I've looked at the paper trail and I have actually talked with the candidate and therefore I will be supporting um, Mr. Klutz. Uh, but I also want to be careful among all of us that we, it is very difficult to get people to serve on our committees. We as public officials are subject to lots of criticism and people on our public committees are also subject to lots of criticism and scrutiny that they don't always want and they certainly don't invite. Since this has happened, We've had at least two more people submit candidates. We have a whole nother round coming up next year. It's always tough to recruit. So I look forward to voting tonight. I hope that we can move forward with this year's candidates. And then I look forward to hearing from the CRC in the future for additional candidates. Are there any other comments? If not, I'm going to move to a vote. I'm going to begin the vote with Lynn Griesmer, who is an aye. Councilor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councilor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. No. Councilor Ryan. Aye. Count Kathy Shane. Epstein. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Abstain. Councilor Walker. Abstain. Patty Angelus. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councilor Rette. Abstain. There's eight in favor, one opposed, and three uh, and four abstentions. The vote, the measure passes. He is appointed to the planning board. Going to move to community liaison reports. Um, community CRC, Pam Rooney. Thank you. CRC uh, has sent the draft solar bylaw to the staff for input and comment. It is not for editing. Um, their comments are due to the CRC on September 10, at which point we will be discussing and understanding staff input. At that point, we will take our next step. Okay. Thank you. And you postponed this week because we did not have those comments yet, correct? Thank you. Uh, Elementary School Building Committee, Kathy. Uh, yes, thanks, Lynn. Oh, uh, yes. Let me just Kathy. make sure I'm on. Am I unmuted? Yeah, I'm yes. unmuted. Um, Paul has in his report, but I'll, I just want to expand a little bit, but that we uh, have not received the final general contractor bids for this school. They're now due on September 19th. We extended the deadline for the electrical sub bids because of a design change director from Eversource, which required changes to the electrical drawing. This in turn required extending the timeline for the general contractor bids. We saw 
canceled the August meeting where we were going to review the bids. And all, uh, but I want to note that all the other sub bids received have been accepted and are on target in terms of budget. So we don't have budgetary concerns. And from what I've been able to gather, this will not have any impact on the expected date of opening at the school. It's still September 2026. We're meeting as a committee on September 20th, where we will have uh, the general contractor bids as well as the final subcontractor bids. Thank you for that update. Um, it, Alicia, is there anything else you wanted to add? Paul, is there anything you wanted to add? Okay. Uh, Finance Committee, Bob Hegner. Um, we haven't had a meeting since our last meeting, uh, last council meeting. Um, the next meeting is on September 3rd. Um, I have asked the town manager if we can have a discussion of the finances of the library and of the finances of the golf course. So hopefully we can, we can do that and we'll get some information on that. Thank you. GOL, Anna. GOL was not able to meet at our last regularly scheduled meeting because um, we did not have a quorum. So we will be meeting this Thursday, the 22nd. The two items on our agenda are the draft charge for the AH, the Her uh, African Heritage Reparation Assembly successor body charge. Um, we started work on that at our last meeting and we'll be continuing that on Thursday. And then the other item is the nuisance bylaw, which we're reviewing for clarity, consistency, and actionability so that we can get that back to the council as soon as possible. We will not be taking up the transportation charge at this meeting. We'll put that on, on the next meeting. That actually won't come to us until after. Oh, right. Sorry. TSR we'll put that on once. Well, I assumed TSO would just get it done, you know, within an hour, but you're probably right. We'll, we'll wait on TSO to get that to us. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. No problem. Uh, Jones Library Building Committee, Pam Rooney. Oh, I'm, yes, no, Pam Rooney. There has not been another meeting since our previous one. And um, I don't know when they are going to be scheduled because maybe Mr. Bachelman can tell us. You don't know. So so there's a lot going on right now. Um, we've, we've um, but we've not seen anything. Okay, thank you. Uh, TSO, Andy? Yes. It is July 15 meeting. We as a council discussed a motion that was recommended by TSO uh, committee to request that the town manager issue an RFP as a part of the process to develop possible new waste hauling system and revised by general bylaw 3.3. We anticipated having a vote at tonight's meeting regarding this motion. Um, we received many good questions from all of you in the council on the July 15th and following that meeting. TSO met on July 25th and had a substantial discussion about your questions, comments, uh, and questions from the public and the process in general. The committee planned to have another meeting on August 15 and present a report tonight. For several reasons, we were unable to meet on August 15th, and I had to step back from the council matters uh, during the first part of August for health reasons, which further complicated the matter. Uh, George Ryan, as committee vice chair, was uh, effectively act acting as chair while I was unable to serve in that role. And uh, he pro um, proposed uh, to the president of the council that we postpone tonight's meeting and uh, our uh, consideration of the motion at this meeting. And she agreed to that request. Uh, TSO will meet on August 29. We will report on both committee meetings at the next uh, council meeting on September 9 and uh, respond to your questions and matters raised by the public. We anticipate that we can provide the information that you need to consider the motion at the uh, September 9 meeting. And so unless there are any questions, that's the report from the committee. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to liaison reports. And I also wanna recognize Pat DeAngelis, 
uh, who actually attended a recreation committee, not as an official liaison, but as a, someone who has taken an interest in that committee. Are there any liaison reports? Jennifer. Um, yes, I think you all received um, a report from the chair of the CPA committee. Yes. But um, yeah, so you really know what the update is that they did vote to approve $800,000 for option 3C, the reorientation for the high school track, which is terrific. And they did ask that, um, you know, the town, uh, that the school committee pursue an increased um, contribution from the other three towns as well. And again, um, the chair of the uh, CPA committee sent the council a more detailed report. So I won't go, I'll leave that for, for you to review on your own. Thank you. And let me just mention that um, they are in process of meeting with the other towns and looking at potential CPA money. Uh, and until I'm waiting for um, both the director of finance, Doug Slaughter, and uh, the town manager, and also Dave Zomack to tell me when they feel we should bring that CPA recommendation to the full council. Councilor Lord, you had your hand up. Is that for a liaison report? Yes, okay. Uh, Pat, let me move to you then. I'm first gonna um, as represent or liaison to the Disability Access Advisory Committee. They have asked me to find out when they're gonna get a copy of the commission charge to review. So, and then um, I really, um, I, and what, <laughs> all right, <laughs> wake up DeAngelis. About a year and a half ago, um, maybe a little more, Councillor Walker and I met with the director of the uh, recreation department to begin to talk about the possibilities of programming uh, for uh, uh, youth empowerment. Um, and um, both Councillor Walker and I have been involved in a lot of things since then. But what has happened is uh, that idea has really percolated with the director of the recreation department and with uh, Becky Demlin, who is the outreach uh, person for the rec department. So I would like to share a brief report with you. Um, uh, so let me see. The Amherst Recreation Department has heard the call for a youth empowerment center in our community. Understanding that such a center is in the early stages, the recreation department has been working diligently to find ways to meet the needs of historically marginalized and at-risk students by expanding the scope of the uh, Amherst Regional Public School Family Center and by providing coaching and social justice programming to Amherst students at our middle and high schools. Um, $200,000 of ARPA funds, uh, separate from the $500,000 that we talk about, have been used to support equity, inclusion, and empowerment of Amherst students, including those who receive IEP services for sensory, physical, and emotional issues. One seven-week pro program was piloted this year, um, and it's called Fun in the Sun Camp. Um, the cre and it was a creation of six-week, four-day-a-week adaptive and inclusive swim pro uh, lesson program that served 32 students with physical disabilities, social, emotional, uh, 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 social emotional disabilities and other characteristics that might make neurotypical swim lessons difficult to support that program. They used ARPA money for the implementation of a culture si city training for both CAP staff and neurotypical AMR students on building sensory inclusivity to address issues of equity empowerment. The morning movement and mentoring program has been going on for a couple of years now. It's a collaboration between the Amherst Public School students, the Recreation Department, the Amherst Regional Public School Family Center, and UMass. And all of those folks facilitated the expansion of the program this year. The transition to middle school can be challenging both academically and socially. The Family Center has been working to better support students and improve their success at ARMS 
by providing before school programming to seventh and eighth grade students through the morning movement and mentoring program. And then actuality, the students were showing up several years ago when we made the transition to a late start and they were kind of hanging out and then they were brought into the gym and the students pushed the development of this morning movement program. So the uh, Family Center launched the MMP program in 2021, enrolling 12 students from the middle school with, Merce with Mr. Seha Kruch as the on-site manager. Mr. Kruch is the Family Center's community liaison and elder in the Amherst Cambodian community. This school year, the Family Center has partnered with Amherst Rec and used uh, ARPA funds um, to support the expansion of the programming. The Amherst Recreation Department provided transportation to 24 students a day by funding three vans to get them to the school gym in the early morning. And because of that, a program that started with 12 students is now supporting an enrollment of 64 students. The part partnership with Amherst Recreation benefits the program in meaningful ways. Amherst Recreation's morning movement and mentoring facilitator, Maria Vega, with her background in youth empowerment and coaching, provides outstanding leadership to the program. Ms. Vega is also the Director of Student Athlete Development at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, which enables her to leverage UMass athletics and athletes to create impact for the students. Funding has also supported the collaboration between the Amherst Recreation Department, the Department of Equity and Inclusion, the Community Responders for Equity, Safety and Service, and the Amherst Police Department. And they have partnered with the Ross Initiative in Sports for Equality, or RISE, which is a national nonprofit that educates and empowers the sports community to eliminate racial discrimination champion social justice and improve race relations. And they offered a nine week in-person leadership program that is designed to create a safe space to break barriers, build trust and create pathways for positive communication, communication. provide a leadership and cultural competency curriculum designed by RISE covering topics such as community building, bias, identity and building trust. They share new perspectives, develop relationships, discuss the challenges participants face and their collective responsibility to create change and build stronger communities and improve relations between youth and the Amherst Police Department. I've got more, but I think that's enough to, for you to even begin to see what the kernel has started to grow into. And we have a long way to go, but these are very important initiatives that have been funded by ARPA and by the Creative Actions people in the Recreation Department. Thank you. Councillor Lord. Um, yes, thank you. I wanted to make an appeal, put it out there that both the Human Rights Commission and the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee have three vacancies each. So anybody who is watching, please talk to your friends, anybody who is on this committee, um, it would be really great to have these fully um, staffed because a lot of the work that we want to do as a town need all those vacancies filled. And I, to connect with the Youth Empowerment Center, I'm glad we're moving forward on that. And I appreciate those initiatives. And I do think the CSWG mentioned um, them or maybe the CSSJC continuing to have a, a role in that. Um, um, I will have to go back and double check, but that it will be its own building separate from the schools eventually and that maybe not an oversight, but some kind of way to support that since that came out of those findings, one of the things that came out of them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like the town clerk to note that Councillor Shane has left the meeting. Um. Are there any other uh, liaison reports? I'd like to go on to the town manager's report. Paul, would you like to provide any quick overview and then open for questions? Sure, um, thank you. Um, so first we have a terrific uh, ceremony this afternoon in this room, to, uh, swearing in uh, at last, uh, 
police chief uh, Gabriel Ting with a reception following at the police station. And it was a jam-packed room and really a, a very brief but moving ceremony. Also, uh, excuse me, Chief Ting will be joining me at a cup of joe on uh, Friday, uh, September 13th at Atkins. Uh, and you're welcome to come. Anybody's welcome to come to talk with him, me, or anything else you'd like to bring up. I want to note that we are at that time of year when colleges are starting to um, reopen. And so you're starting to see, uh, it's been very quiet the last couple of weeks, but we're starting to see an uptick in traffic and people in town. The colleges all begin the first week of, you know, generally September 3rd, September 4th range, but people are coming in before then, obviously. Uh, I want to note that there's a new town manager report. There's a typo on uh, the, on on the election date, the last day to apply for um, early voting is, is, or for absentee ballot is on August 26th, but the election is the day after Labor Day. Um, so there are things on the ballot. So if people want to vote, they can vote. And all the dates are on the town manager report. Um, there's also a pretty detailed summary that, um, about how the town responded to the crowd strike outage. Uh, and I was just really proud of our IT department for just coming in at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and working through the day to get us back up and running and making sure that our core uh, services, i.e. our dispatch, police, fire, and wastewater and water were up and running and operational, and we didn't miss a beat during that whole thing. So just a real credit to our, our, um, our, our IT team, uh, including our IT director who was camping in Rhode Island and came back at four in the morning to be able to help out as we were, every computer needed to be touched in one way or another to, be, to get to get it back up and running. Uh, Councilor D'Angelo has talked a lot about uh, some of the work that the recreation department in the report is a, a more detailed assessment of the aquatics program along the same lines to sort of outline a little bit about what the aquatics efforts are being done. The tax work off increase for the senior center, for the seniors, uh, um, so we had initially interpret that to be something that the council had to vote on, uh, town attorney reviewed it and said, because the town, uh, the council had already adopted the law. So we could just administratively increase the amount. So we will be sending out something announcing that tonight that we'll be increasing it from 1500 to $2,000 and then send out a notice uh, to everybody who's, especially those using, utilizing it, um, that the amount you can earn as part of our tax work off will go from $1,500 to $2,000. Um, and then, and I think uh, Councilor Lord talked about the, um, uh, this, the, we are looking for lots of members. We do have interviews scheduled with, we have some, some very strong candidates for CSSJC. Those are, we tried to schedule those last week, but uh, people's schedules just didn't work. So those are scheduled in September as our um, interviews for the HRC the and the Council on Aging. And you will, we've already had interviews for the Energy and Climate Action Committee. So you'll be getting those on Monday. Um, and that's it. That's why I have to answer any questions you may have. Okay. Bob Hegner. Yeah, uh, Paul, um, on the uh, the increase in the, uh, the tax work off, um, is that going to be effective immediately, the $500 yes. increase? Okay. Can you include that in the um in the announcement uh because yeah, i've been asked that question that specific question because mm -hmm. uh, i b believe the res the residents ha only have until sometime in november to complete their hours so mm -hmm. the, the the sooner they know they can do it this year yep. the, the better good pam rooney thank you um Paul, can we can the council get an update on the Jones Library finance plan mm -hmm. with contributions with I income status by at, like at our next meeting, please? I can work on so much of it is dependent on where the friends are, so we can give you a status report on where they are. They usually report; they can report on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I was just making a note for that, for the September 9th. Thank you. Uh, George Ryan. So uh, two things, uh, Paul, quickly. Um, uh, returning from my lovely vacation in Seabrook uh, and basking in the uh, glow of the nuclear power station, I noticed coming down Main Street that the VFW building was gone. And so I uh, wanted to congratulate you on the quick removal of that structure. 
and make a plea, as I think I've already mentioned to you, about the clubhouse at Hickory Ridge, which has been around much longer, and a number of my constituents are concerned about it as a public safety uh, issue. It's uh, been it's suffered a fair amount of vandalism and graffiti. Anyway, it's just a, a request that, that we try to get that building down as soon as possible. Um, I also noticed that the little notice for the Center East comments um, alerting people to the fact that there are affordable houses, housing units available in town. And I just wanted to point out to my colleagues that uh, according to my count, we now have 68 uh, units in town that are under the IZ bylaw. And uh, it's really difficult for people uh, who are, could possibly take advantage of that to hear about it and learn about it. And uh, it's just uh, not so much addressed to Paul directly, but to all of us, uh, if there's some way we could create a one-stop system uh, the state system for finding these kinds of units is cumbersome and difficult, um, but it is a system that we have. I'm just hoping that maybe through the housing trust and or through planning, we could figure out a way to uh, help people uh, know more quickly and more accurately what we have available. I'm thinking particularly the IZ bylaw units um, as a place to start. Yes, so we can address those two things. So Hickory is scheduled. Uh, I don't think it's gone out to bid yet, but it will go out this, this fall, probably later in the fall. Um, it's just a matter of getting the, the RFP out the door, um, but we, there are funds available to take care of that. Um, in terms of the Center East Commons, you know, we ran into this relatively recently with someone who uh, I met at the senior center who needed immediate housing. And I, I just sort of said, Let, let's try and navigate how to find housing available in, in, in Amherst. And it was really just, it was non-existent. It, the, center, the state system is a good idea. It's not functional. Um, we for us to build something and maintain it ourselves would be something that would be a goal uh, but it's i just think i don't know if we'll be able to be actively managing it on a regular basis to make sure that the unit isn't rented or is rented um but we are you know that was exactly the same question i had it's like well how how do we let people know what units are available because we hear from developers saying we've got units that we can't rent and so like show me where those are and i think that's one of the things the housing trust has actually talked about how many of these units are actively occupied? How many are vacant? How, how do we, can we monitor that or uh, at least get an inventory at this point in time? So we are talking about ways of doing that. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Walker. Um, thank you. I have three questions and then sort of a, a comment. Um, but I'm wondering in the town manager report, um, regarding reparations, there's a comment regarding the uh, legal opinion from the town attorney regarding the funding stream, but I'm wondering about the status of the standing committee for reparations and what is going on there, and if there's any reason that that committee can't start recruiting and have a charge before we get the legal opinion as to the funding source, because I think regardless of what the outcome of the legal opinion is that we <clears throat> would want a committee who can take that information in and move us forward in some kind of way. Um, and so I'm wondering if there's any status on that or how we intend to proceed there. Sure. So we do have the legal opinion that's been shared. I can share that with you again, if that'd be helpful. Um, and I think the charge is with the GOL committee at this point in time. Yes. And we'll be on the GOL discussion this Thursday. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I'm also wondering about um, an update on the remaining ARPA funds and the plan for spending. I know we did talk about possibilities. Um, I'm wondering if any decisions have been made and if we'll be updated as to what those are. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So we did make a presentation mm -hmm. to the council, but I think it's it would be good to give you an update on where that is. Our mission is to make sure we don't have we don't leave any money on the table. So anything we'll make sure that all that money is is somehow allocated at least to free cash. <laughs> in which case, then the count it'll be within the council purview to allocate it if it if it so chooses. Um, but I can give you an update on where we are on that. We we have a team that looks at that pretty regularly and trying to sort of crank down on people who have allocations but haven't spent the money yet. So, because uh, we want all those little pockets of money, we want to make sure we gather them up and make sure they get allocated either um, as revenue replacement, which is what's called when it just goes into the back into the free cash pot, 
or for an actual project. If I can give you an update on that. Um, yeah, that would be great. And can you remind me the date by which all of our ARPA monies needs to be allocated? Uh, December 31. Uh, 2024? Yes. For okay. allocation, it has to be under contract by then. Uh, spent, it's 2020, December 31, 2026, I think it is. And does that, allo that allocation includes if it were committed to returning to free cash, that is still considered an allocation? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then I just wanted to make a, sorry, a sort of a longer comment regarding the Youth Empowerment Center. And I do have a question in there, but I did want to thank Pat for uh, the update because I think that that was really helpful. Um, and also a few comments about just the transparency of the process. So while um, I did meet with um, Pat and Ray and we had some great conversations um, about possibilities and thoughts around youth empowerment, Shortly after that conversation, I believe Ray came back to Pat and I and said that the Youth Empowerment Center was being moved out of REC. And so we didn't continue to have those conversations with Ray. And so I was actually surprised to learn that the Youth Empowerment Center is now back under the REC department. Um, and so I guess this is just a question slash comment about transparency, because I'm not sure when that move happened. Um, Pat, feel free to, to jump in. That's yeah. okay. It, there, it, the Youth Empowerment Center is not in the rec department. What he did was take our ideas about what could we start before there is an official Youth Empowerment Center? What kind of work can we uh, begin to do with students? It is not a replacement for the uh, Youth Empowerment Center. Right. So and there I was no decision to have the rec department become the youth empowerment center or place where that's happening. Just okay. Quality. And I think that was what my initial understanding was. And I may be slightly misled because of some of the conflicting information, but I did learn at the CSSJC meeting that it is now under the purview of the rec department and that they are doing some type of uh, they have some type of working group that is looking at these things. And so I just, again, it's more of a comment on the transparency as to where these things are placed, who we can be in conversation with when we're wanting to, you know, be included in the process or to contribute to the process of moving this forward and providing okay. ideas and feedback. And um, I did not know as much as you knew. So Paul, <laughs> can you clarify that? Sure. So I think those are really good questions. We actually have a meeting later this week to sort of clear the decks in terms of who's doing what on this, because it has been other so for several people taking initiatives and sometimes not making the progress that we needed to to make. And because it's it's the funding folks, and then it's also REC, it seemed to live there. Um, DEI, uh, we're really fortunate to have Philip Avila now with us. There's that's a really he's a really strong player he's already started to comment on some of the, the processes. So the, we're meeting this later this week to sort of like get our get, our, get our, our plans in gear and understand what has to happen over the next three months to get some to get this project going. And also make sure that we're doing it the right way. It's not just get the money spent, but and I think there, that's, we've been having some significant um, internal conversations about that. So I think by your next meeting, we could help hopefully have some more clarity on that. And I think you're right on the transparency thing because it's been a little muddled and I'll be admit to that. Thank you. Yeah. And I would love to see like that information when there are updates or decisions made included in the town manager report. I think that that would be really helpful um, just in terms of keeping track of the process. Um, but then I did also just want to make a comment um, looking back and reflecting back on the work uh, from when I was on the CSWG and the intentions around the recommendation of the Youth Empowerment Center, um, which again is a youth empowerment center that we intended to be for all youth with a focus on BIPOC youth. And I wanted to just speak to that for a minute and how it relates to the experiences of myself and my family this summer um, using rec department services. Um, and so first off, I just want to start and say the rec department is amazing. Uh, my family has had an amazing time working with them this summer. They've had programs for mostly just my younger kiddos, but they have done a really good job. I've enjoyed working with both 
Becky, Marion, Ray, they've been really accommodating and working with my, uh, worked with my family over the summer. Um, but I wanted to really highlight the emphasis as to why BIPOC Youth Empowerment Center. Um, so while we have a lot of programming that is great and is beneficial, I think to get a more holistic understanding of the impacts on BIPOC youth in particular, or low income youth in this community, it's important to understand the impacts of the deficit or lack of services that we do have for that specific category of youth. Um, <clears throat> for example, the Fun in the sum Summer Camp that is offered to youth has a limited amount of spots. I know a lot of these things are funding issues, but I think it's important to understand its impacts. It has a limited amount of spots that they offer to children who enroll using state funded vouchers. So if the state is going to pay for your child's placement, they only allow a certain amount of people with vouchers to enroll in that program, which makes it really hard because spaces fill up very quickly. It's high demand for that program. Um, secondly, again, this is a funding issue. Um, because uh, staffing for rec programs is typically just college students. There is not, it's not full-time employees. It's not people who have sp uh, specific training or expertise in caring for or dealing with children. Um, and so what happens is that students who have IEPs, students who are not uh who are English language learners and other non-traditional students, which BIPOC students are overwhelmingly rep represented amongst these demographics, cannot adequately be served in these programs. And it's not because they don't want to, and it's not because they don't care. The staff are amazing and they work really hard to try to make accommodations, but they cannot. They cannot accommodate IEPs. They do not have the funding. They do not have the staff. They don't have the ability to give one-on-one -on -one care to the campers. Um, and so those campers are falling through the cracks. Um, and so there is a limited amount, there's a limited amount of services that they can receive from the rec department. Additionally, um, I know Pat spoke about the morning movement program with the middle school, which again is really great. And I have a middle schooler who wanted to attend the program, but it's in the morning, um, which is really difficult for a teen who is interested in sleeping in in the morning and already has to get up and get ready for school. Um, and so while that's been a great opportunity and he did try to do it, it was really hard for consistency in terms of waking up in the morning, being well rested and being successful for the rest of the day at school. Um, and so what I've been facing with my teenager um, and a lot of his friends is that we've been seeing increased levels of depression, anxiety, um, inability to have really successful social interactions because there are not programs for them. There was not one program under the rec center that my middle schooler could be enrolled in because he does not already have a background in sports. And so it goes by age. And because he's older, there is no beginner basketball for middle schoolers or any of those kinds of things. Um, and again, the way in which this displays in our community then is that it is affecting low income BIPOC students disproportionately. And they are, they need things to do. They need a youth empowerment center. Like I am just reeling with what I see with my kids and with their friends and with the other parents in this community, when I talk to other parents, like this is a reoccurring theme that has come up over and over and over again, the lack of things for kids to do, uh, BIPOC kids where their, where their needs can actually be accommodated. Um, and so I, I am making this statement because this is the reason why the CSWG recommended that the Youth Empowerment Center be under the DEI office not because the rec center <clears throat> isn't amazing. They were amazing and they really worked with my family and my kids enjoyed their time, but they don't have the capacity or the ability to accommodate non-traditional students. And this is where the gap in services is in our town. This is the gap that we're trying to address. And so I strongly encourage that even if the rec center is involved, that DEI might also be involved and that we might also see that there's a partnership here because we need to address the needs of our 
marginalized youth in this town. It's it's just not happening. Even with the great plethora of services that we're providing, we're still missing a significant demographic of youth. Thank uh, this, you. This, yeah, this is super useful. I appreciate that, Alicia. Thank you very much, Councillor Walker, for sharing your family's experience. Um, all right, George, you still have your hand up. Okay. Uh, I have a couple other things that are not related to this. Uh, you mentioned specifically uh, HR having to spend some time this summer about round recruitment and retention. And it raises the question as to whether or not we need to re-engage the issue of salary competitiveness. Um, and you might want to speak to that. And then the other question is, um, we seem to have serious trouble recruiting inspectors. And the question that, that brings up for me and maybe for other counselors is, are we going to then delay the implementation of the rental registration bylaw or do we may, need to make some adjustment to the bylaw that allows us to do rental um, inspection in a different way? So recruitment uh, and retention are two important things that have really uh, cropped up. Our salaries have have not been as uh, been keeping up. Uh, much of the many of the salaries are governed by our collective bargaining agreements. Um, to go outside those bargaining agreements is a, a bit of a challenge. But um, and we've been thinking really creatively, especially around skilled positions like uh, water, wastewater treatment, um, paramedics, uh, re attracting and recruiting paramedics and police officers. So there's a really high demand for all of these um, these professions. Um, we have expanded our um, who can apply for jobs to try and get in, in the idea of hiring people and then training. Um, and that's been somewhat successful. Um, and so we're, we're trying to different do different things to give opportunities um, to people who uh, um, who might otherwise not have applied for jobs. Um, and then we're also being poached. We, we do a really good job at um, hiring people, uh, training them, sending them to school, and then another um, community or a, a, a for-profit company will come in and, and, and pay them a lot more money than we can pay them. So that's the challenge. Um, we, so in, in our building inspections to services, you know, we are looking for multiple building inspectors. We have other uh, inspection positions open as well. Um, we're actively recruiting, trying to do everything we can to um, to attract people. There, every community is looking for building inspectors. We have um, talked about what this means for the inspection uh, for the rental registration program. We're not prepared to talk about that at this point in time. Our first order of business is to get inspectors on staff. Um, so people who are actually building buildings and they need an inspection done, there's someone there who will inspect it so they can complete the, the construction of the building. And that goes for plumbing, gas, electrical, uh, and building. So we're trying to do everything we can to hold on to folks. We've had a really good run with existing staff who've been, been together and solid for a, a number of years. but. Um, they're all getting to a certain age where they look at something else in their lives as well. So I think, you know, recruiting is what probably the highest priority right now, uh, for inspection services in terms of getting strong people in, um, or, and again, when it's the situation where we're willing to recruit, hire and train as best we can, and we're thinking up different strategies. So a lot of staff time, uh, by individual department and by um, uh, the HR department has gone into um, recalibrating how we have done things in the past. Um, you know, just thinking of non-traditional ways to recruit people, what has worked in the past, how if we recruited people can use personal contacts. Some communities are starting to offer bonuses uh, to be hired. We have not gone that down that path yet. That brings up a lot of equity issues in, in my mind. So, um, but we're putting everything on the table because staffing is becoming a uh, a, a real challenge, uh, especially again with the licensed and skilled positions. So I think those are all legitimate things. We're not ready to talk about 
that what it imp how it impacts inspection services. But if that if that becomes an issue, we will bring it back to the council. Thank you. Um, I believe that uh, Anna Devlin Gothier has lost connectivity or left the meeting. Thank you, uh, Aunt Jennifer. Um, yes, I just had it's getting late, so I won't ask um, Paul to respond now. But maybe you could include an update in your next annual report. But I was concerned when we received, I think it was on July 20th, um, an email from the operations manager at the wastewater division of the DPW. And that because of, I think, infrastructure issues and valves needing to be replaced, that there were um, a lot of staff were working long overtime hours. And again, is that a staffing issue or an equipment issue or both? So if maybe you could provide an update on how that's, we're trying to remedy that situation. Yeah, I mean, we have aging infrastructure. We all, we know that that puts additional demands on our staff who are really should, should be in operations, but then they're also managing equipment valves that are failing, things like that. And um, so they're actively engaged in that. Um, and that's for lots of different buildings. You know, we see it through different uh, aging buildings, uh, but also especially in our wastewater treatment plant as we've been watching that um, and trying to stay ahead of it. Um, but sometimes some, and then there's also when things, sometimes it's not a supply issue. Sometimes it's a supply issue. It's not a funding issue. It's not a staffing issue. It's that there's a six month wait for the, the part that you need. And so we have to manage through, um, you know, very creatively. Our staff is really creative at figuring out how to maintain the services that we provide to the public, especially for water and wastewater. But sometimes the, there's just a long wait for things and it's true for vehicles as well. Um, so it's a tough time and uh, everything is just, as, we, as we're all experiencing in our own lives, it's, things are going up in, in cost. And so um, trying to manage through that has been a real challenge for our department heads, especially. I guess the concern was that how much the staff were having to work you know, we're being called in in the middle of the night and having to work around the clock. So, yep, that's a concern. Okay. Um, moving on, um, I did provide a president's report. It was pretty meager because I actually went on vacation, um, enjoyed it, and thank. Hope you all enjoyed yours. Are there any questions on the president's report, except for the fact that I will not ride an electric bike? unless I am in a parking lot with no cars. <laughs> They're very interesting. I had never ridden one. I'm a, quite an experienced bike rider, so I, uh, huh? It is like a little car. Um, so no questions on that. Let me just mention on September 9th, we will have uh, a resolution regarding bike trails. We are exploring whether or not we're going to do a Puerto Rican Heritage Day resolution uh, will move to a next discussion on town manager goals. Based on our discussion tonight, I may adjust that. Our action items will include the nuisance bylaw, the waste hauler bylaw, uh, and motion for an RFP. And there may be some discussion about school safety zones. Um, on September 23rd, we move back to our required public forum for the master plan and looking at the evaluation process for the town manager, which we touched on tonight, and the second reading and vote on the nuisance bylaw. Uh, Jennifer, you have your hand up. I'm sorry, I did forget to mention that Pam and I are having a District 4 meeting on a week from Thursday, August 29th, from 6 to 8 p.m. in the Woodbury Room at the Jones Library. I just want to share that. And I'm sorry, again, that is September, no. I'm sorry, August 29th. I'm sorry, August 29th. So it's before we meet again um, at the Jones Library from 6 to 8 p.m. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Then I'd like to make a motion to adjourn and seek a second. Second, DeAngelis. Um, motion's been made and seconded. We'll begin the vote with Councilor Haneke. Aye. Uh, Bob Hegner. Aye. Councilor Lord. Aye. Cameron. Yes. Councilor Ryan. 
Aye. Kathy Shane is absent. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Uh, is absent. Uh, Councilor Ette. Aye. And Lynn Griesmer. Aye. The meeting is adjourned. It's 927. Thank you.